Mormon Mental Health Podcast is a production of the Open Stories Foundation and relies on donations from its listeners like you. To help keep this podcast alive, please consider becoming a monthly subscriber. Any amount will make a difference. You can click the right-hand donate button on mormonmentalhealth.org. All contributions are tax-deductible within the United States and go towards podcast production and building community support and program development for Mormons on various paths and journeys. Thank you for listening. Hello and welcome to Mormon Mental Health Podcast. This is Natasha Helfer Parker. Excited to be with you on another evening. And tonight we are going to be talking about a recent talk that was given by Elder and Sister Renland, I believe, at a am I, I I'm pretty sure it was a BYU Hawaii yes. devotional. Is that correct? Am I yes, correct? it is. Yeah. Just recently, like in January, and it was kind of addressing doubts and doubters, and I have some concerns about it. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And I've invited a guest on who actually happens to be an old friend and ward mate of mine from many years ago. (laughs) So I'll introduce him in a minute. Just a few announcements before we get started. For those who are interested, I am going to be offering one of these kind of faith transition retreats where we talk a lot about relationships and parenting and kind of how to stay. This one in particular is for people who want to maybe stay involved with Mormonism or maybe have a spouse who wants to stay involved with Mormonism and are wanting kind of creative ways and health positive ways to stay involved and build upon their spirituality, et cetera. I work with Dan Witherspoon on these retreats and it's coming up next weekend in the Salt Lake City area. So if anybody's interested in anything like that, Uh, You can always find any events that I'm doing at my personal website, which is natashaparker.org. So go there and figure out if that's something you'd like to look into. Also, I just want to remind everybody that this podcast does not happen out of thin air. It needs your financial support. It's the only way that I can keep it sustainable. We reached our sustainability goals last year. And so here we are again, trying to reach them for 2019 for all of you who donate either once or regularly, I give you a huge shout out. I love this part of my job. I want to continue doing it. I love bringing kinds of all types of topics that address mental health within our Mormon communities and really appreciate your support. And if you find value and haven't become a subscriber or not a donor yet, please consider a donation. And you can do that right on the podcast page, webpage, which is mormonmentalhealth.org. There's some very easy donate buttons. And again, those can be one time, or you can kind of do like a subscription type of donation where you just throw a few bucks my way every month or, or whatever you, you can do. If you want to support me in non-financial ways, because not everybody can great ways to do that is to like my Mormon mental health podcast, Facebook page, share one of these podcast page uh, interviews with, you know, on your page or to a friend or things like that. And there's even ways that you can write a review on the page as well. And any positive feedback would be super welcome. So just hopefully if you find value in this work that I do, please figure out maybe a small way that you can support what I'm doing here. So I really appreciate that. Okay. So moving on then to the interview, Mike Hansi. Hello. Hello. You are coming to us from... Laramie, Wyoming. Laramie, Wyoming. And we used to live in a town called West Bend, Wisconsin. A long correct. time ago. A <laughs> long time ago. <laughs> yeah. So I'd like to start out just by giving you an opportunity to share a little bit about who you are and what you do in life and your story and how you come to be a person who was involved with Mormonism and have had the experience of being one who now has transitioned from Mormonism. So that's a lot to it is a lot to just put into a few uh, minutes. So go okay. go for it. <laughs> okay. Um, I was born and raised in the Salt Lake area, just north of Salt Lake and Bountiful. Um, adopted into a, a wonderful Mormon family, did all of the things that Mormon children do, baptized at eight, priesthood, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, served a mission in South America. Uh, Came back, uh, married quickly after the return from the mission, Um, lived in Arizona for nine years, Wisconsin for six, served uh, in various leadership positions during that time, 
uh, various elders quorum presidencies, elders quorum president number of times, bishopric, member, counselor, executive secretary. Uh, when we were in Wisconsin together, I was called as a branch president in a new branch uh, that combined two portions of two different wards. Um, and that's where you and I met um, during that time. Um, noticed some things weren't quite right with one of my children. I don't want to say that in a negative way, just that she was experiencing life in a different way than I was planning on or expecting as a parent. Um, from there, from after Wisconsin, we moved to Idaho and we were there for three years. And for the last eight years, I've been living here in Laramie, Wyoming. Um, again, during all that time from Wisconsin to now, served in various leadership positions within the Mormon church, uh, high priest group leader, again, bishopric member, uh, different things along the way. About four years ago, um, our oldest daughter, uh, Rachel, came out as gay. And it wasn't a surprise. We kind of suspected something along the way. And that was really the moment where I started thinking, how can this possibly be? What could I have done different as a parent to ensure that this wouldn't happen to my child? And that's kind of where my faith transition started. It took me a long time to get past that, um, to figure out that she's who she is, that she is how God created her. So anyway, she came out as gay, and as a as a her father, I started looking for answers. And the first place I went to was LDS.org, looking for answers to how can I help her, how can I help us as a family. Um, typical things that you would think of a father would want to do to help his family out. Um, I don't even remember how I got on to the gospel topics essays. Um, I just clicked through different things on my app on my phone and I was there and I just started reading the gospel topics essays. And after, gosh, I don't know, maybe a half hour reading it, I was probably in church sometime. I thought this is not what I was taught as the child. This is not what I mm. was taught as a missionary. This is not what I preached over the pulpit as a branch president. This is not anything what I was familiar with as a member of the church, a lifelong member of the church. And I just kept reading. I went from one essay to the next. And the ones that stood out in my mind were probably the different versions of the first vision. Mm -hmm. um, polygamy was a big one. Um, those things just kind of shocked me. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't remember. And I, so I started doing investigation research on the internet. Where where did these things come from? Clicking on the links at the bottom of the page. And eventually I ended at the CES letter. And that's, as I read through that numerous, numerous times, things just started making more and more sense mentally to me. Um, and during this time, I was still a faithful member of the church, um, serving in a bishopric, actually, his first counselor in a bishopric. And for right or wrong, I chose to keep all of those things to myself. Mm -hmm. um, I did not share them with my family members. Um, my soon-to-be ex-wife probably knew that there were things going on because I was acting different around the house, um, mm -hmm. things I would say. So long story short, um, in July of this year, the end of July, 1st of August, I finally came clean to my wife, soon to be ex-wife, and um, told her what I believed. And the first words out of her mouth was, I'm surprised you lasted this long. And things kind of roller coastered from there. And um, I eventually left the church officially, uh, stopped attending. And shortly after um, Elder Redland's talk, I submitted my resignation formally through quitmormon.org and have never felt better in my life. So that's the long story. That's a long version, the short version of it. There's obviously more to it, but those are the highlights. So just some interesting kind of thoughts right off the bat is, you know, this was not a faith transition that was elicited by misinformation from untrusted sources. These are kind of some Correct. of the words that are typically used when we're warned at church from, you know, going on the internet and 
relying on sources that are not church-based, you started kind of questioning and, and being concerned with information that was right on LDS.org. And it is a somewhat surprising, well, I don't know if it's somewhat surprising or not, but it is interesting, I guess, to me, how many people still who are very active members of the church are not aware of the gospel essays. They're not, they're, they've been coming out now for, when did they start coming out? Like five years ago or five, four years, years ago? ago. And, um, and yet they never were announced, right? They were Correct. never like, it was never like, oh, by the way, here's this new thing we're doing and everybody go check it out. And <laughs> I right. think in, in, in a lot of ways, it's kind of meant to be there only as a resource for people who maybe are having certain questions about our history or about certain aspects of our doctrine that tend to be problematic for those who start thinking about some of these issues that, that mm -hmm. tend to come up. So that's an interesting dynamic in of itself. It's also interesting that you're one of many, many, many people who start off also a faith transition through the coming out process of a gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, et cetera, child, right? So when you, we kind of know this from the research is that when we tend to fit the norm or the population's kind of expectations, church, and this is not true just about Mormon church, but church in general can be a very healthy, wonderful place for people. But when people don't fit it, mm -hmm. you know, the norm of the community or the expectations of a religious culture, now all of a sudden it can become extremely, not only just hurtful, but actually can cause mental health harm. And there can be some real, real serious ramifications with, you know, of course, the, the ultimate kind of concern being suicidal ideation. So right. these are real issues. And so I've worked with many, many, you know, parents of LGBTQ plus kids, folks themselves who go through those, you know, those coming out processes themselves. And this tends to be a, a precursor to a many people having some type of shift in their faith, even if it's not necessarily leaving the church, it's usually leaving a more orthodox perspective that, that, than, right. they, than what they used to have. So your, your story kind of matches those things. The other reason why I picked you to talk to me about this particular talk, because it was, you know, one way very understandable and in another way kind of hurt my heart a little <laughs> was when you spoke, you know, you, you had, a, I don't know where I found your response to this talk that we're going to speak about, but you talk not only of how harmful it was to you to read this talk or to listen to it, but that it acted as a catalyst for you removing your name. Exactly. From our church. So, yep. and I'm still a member of the church, right? So in a sense, it was this feeling like, gosh, the, the fact that we don't deal with these things well is, um, and you may have left anyway, and I'm not trying to shame your choice of leaving at all. Like that's a totally legitimate choice, but in a way it felt like I just lost a, a community family member because at least in some part, it was catalyzed by what I think is a really unfortunate kind of crummy talk. Yeah. And if I could just interject something real quick here. Yes. Um, when I was going through my faith transition and crisis, I, I, there's three phases to me, a crisis, a transition, and an exodus, if that's what the person chooses to do. And as I was talking to my bishop at the time, I said, I will know when the time is right for me to have my name removed. And I will, I will know when that is. It, it was not a predetermined date or predetermined event. It was just something with inside of me that I would know when the time was right for me. And after I heard the talk, I knew that I, I could no longer be a part of an organization that dehumanized, I will say, those people going mm -hmm. through a faith transition crisis. So that's, that was the reason why it was a catalyst for me. Yes. And I, and I think that you're quite validated in that feeling and concern. I, I was highly distressed by this talk myself. And so just kind of an overall umbrella view of it. Uh, first of all, it's a talk given to a large amount of people and these people are young adults, right? Mm -hmm. So right away as they kind of characterize people who go through faith transitions one thing that i noticed that that happens is we pretend and i, ha I and i always have to bring sex stuff up because i'm a sex therapist but uh -huh. <laughs> I, I think that oftentimes when we talk to people we pretend 
like the things that we're worried about, the people who, you know, shouldn't do certain things are not in our audience. Right. So for example, when we talk about premarital sex, we talk to the group like nobody has had premarital sex. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so in a lot of ways, you know, elder and sister, um, oh my gosh, I'm going to mess up their name. Res- Resland. Renland. Renland. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. I have, you know, I always remind people that English is my second language and I struggle. <laughs> so, a lot of people don't know that, but I struggle with, <laughs> I still spell things wrong all the time. The same stupid words. Anyway, they're talking to people like nobody in the audience has gone through something like this or is in, a, or is in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. They talk about it only assuming that everybody's on their same page. So right from the start, you're already otherizing people that you may already, that you're right in front of and that you mm-hmm. don't know what level of, you know, heartache or distress or personality traits or mental health concerns they're going through. And now you're isolating them even further by right. sending a talk like that. So that was a concern of mine, not to mention how many of these kids are having parents or siblings who are going yep. through a faith transition And now they have very, it's almost like we're setting up people to um, see others in their social circles as enemies almost, or, you know, and so that's very concerning to me, not to mention, of course, one that the most important, some of the most important relationships is a marriage, you know, and so if you've got a situation where you have a mixed faith marriage, which is already a challenge, especially in our culture of Mormonism, Mm -hmm. Now you're pitting people who are married against each other in ways that are completely inappropriate. So the whole thing was very sad to me. So that's my umbrella thing. Why don't I let you do an umbrella? <laughs> like, tell me a little <laughs> bit about how did you even come across this talk? Why were you listening to it? And oh. what were some of your reactions? Oh, my goodness. Um well, through Mormon Stories podcast, I saw that it was going to be taking place a couple of days or maybe a day before. And so I reluctantly said, okay, I'll give it a listen to see what it is exactly they're saying. And what we've heard through conference talks, through other different types of firesides or um, addresses like this, CES addresses things of church leaders' hierarchy addressing people through faith transitions. And I thought, okay, m- maybe this time they'll say something that isn't hurtful to me. So that's where I, that's where I started. So I, I started listening to it and I, I hate to use this term, but it, it's the primary voice. When Sister Renlin started speaking with that primary voice and it was very condescending to me. Mm. And then Elder Renlin also spoke in just the tone of his voice was, I don't know, just very condescending, um, treated, it sounded like we were being spoken to as less thans. Mm. Um, so the, that was just my first initial response. Um, then the video of the parable, a cartoon. Uh, these are young adults. I understand why they chose to do a cartoon of this parable with the boy and the, the ship, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that it was, we're not. Can you told. describe that for those who maybe haven't watched <clears throat> it? And also, by the way, for those of you who are, you know, participating and hearing this, this, this podcast on Facebook live, I'd also love for you to answer some of these questions. You know, what did, if you're aware of this talk, what did you find either helpful or not helpful about it? So, you know, interact with us as well as we're talking, Mike and I. So describe the video. Is that what you're? Yeah, it's the cartoon part of it. Okay. So people Um, know what you're talking about in case they haven't heard it. The talk. Right. Right. So, uh, Elder Redland, I guess I don't know who came up with this parable of a a a boy on a ship, a boat, and things were he wasn't happy with it, and he started looking for other things, and this old man comes to talk to him, and says, you know, yeah, we've got rust and dented things in this ship, but these other people out there, I don't, I don't even remember the whole thing because it just made me so mad. But anyway, it was something along those lines where go out, you know, if you look for other things outside of the ship, you're not going to be as happy as you, as you are here. Um, 
And right, and the ship being dented and rusted, I mean, maybe we can give them a little bit of credit there because at least they're acknowledging that the ship isn't perfect, right? The right. Ship is not like a fabulous yacht <laughs> with no yeah, problem. The, the, the ship, <laughs> the good ship Zion that Elder Ballard spoke of many years ago is now rusted and dented, which I thought was kind of an interesting way of... Um, of a strange progression, but at least like, they're progressing. At least um, acknowledging that we have some issues, which yeah, is okay, the, right? It's okay. Yeah, good, good ship side is kind of rusted and dented now. Uh, okay, great. Um, so the young boy on the ship is looking around thinking he's or on this boat. He's thinking things would be better out there. Um, and the old man saying, no, stay here. You won't be happy. Basically, that's, mm -hmm, that's the gist mm -hmm, of it. Mm -hmm. uh, Gosh, where to even begin with it? Because mm -hmm. it was a cartoon, to me, it's like Saturday morning cartoons. Maybe when I was eight or nine, that would have been something that would appeal to me. As a well, and maybe what you're saying is that in a way, it's too simplistic of a narrative. Like it right. kind of ignores the complexity and the distress and the, the thought process and oftentimes the years Exactly. Of what transitioners go through and trying to make sense of all these different kinds of narratives and scripts. Right. Correct. And I, I agree with that. Going through a faith crisis and transition is a very complex issue. It's not like one day you wake up and say, hey, today I'm not a believer. Uh, for me, from my experience, was it was little bits of pieces along the way were taken away from me. Um, the phrase, you know, your shelf comes crashing down. Well, mine came down and bits and pieces. It didn't come down all at once. And to have it simplified in such a way that it seemed childish was, it negated almost everything that I went through, all mm -hmm. the struggles that I went through. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I did probably the most was I talked to God. I prayed probably more than I ever have during those four years because I wanted the church to be true. I wanted these things that I've been taught to be from God. And mm -hmm. the more I studied, the more I learned, the more I prayed, the more the answer came back was, it's not my church. I mean, mm -hmm. I can remember the day and the moment when I finally got an answer to those things. And it was after four, nearly four years of struggle, of mm -hmm. sleepless nights, of anxiety, of now looking back on it, a severe depression where I self-medicated through food. Um, mm. a very complex issue to, and to have it reduced in such a simplistic way negated everything that I went through. And I guess I was hopeful that some leader in the church would say, Hey, we understand what you're going through. We know that it's hard. We know that there are difficult issues that you have to deal with, but to see it reduced in such a way like that was just offensive, um, maddening. It brought back a lot of hurt and pain that I had, I thought I had dealt with in a way, but I brought it back in a new way where it's like, I don't have to put up with this anymore type of thing. So I don't know if that kind of explains my feelings. Yeah, on it. yeah no. And I think some, one of the things that you're talking about also is, I mean, in a sense, when you listen to this talk, you are, were still a member of our church, right? Yes. It's almost like they've chosen to just focus on the the people who are still kind of in maybe an orthodox or maybe more what we call true believing type of stance right and it kind of ignore it's just like well if you're not in that stance we're not even going to address you we're not even mm -hmm. going to talk to you or acknowledge you we're already going to otherize you right and so it's not it was not an inclusive type of feel to the talk where again it acknowledges that there may be many among you who have come to this very meeting who, mm -hmm. you know, have questions or have doubts. And, and, and the one, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, the one thing that, that also stood out in my mind is we're all in different places with the church. Some mm -hmm. of us, like you mentioned, are the true believers who are there a hundred percent. And there's some who maybe have a, a question or a concern about whatever issue it is. And, and it was just um, not, it wasn't inclusive and it was very exclusive of so many different people. And that part was frustrating as well. I wanted to, I just wanted to say we are all people. We're all humans. We're all members of the church. We've all been there. We understand what you're saying, 
but there's lots of questions and concerns that have never been addressed by church hierarchy that that needs to be and yeah the gospel topics essays kind of do it but you can't find them easy it's it's a convoluted mess that is not really easy to sift through and i think they he or this talk just simplified it too much and negated our experiences right right do you let me ask you this question do you still have family members who are involved in the church and either kiddos or you mentioned an ex-spouse or extended family or friends uh yes uh i have uh one two children who are still in the church um my soon-to-be ex-wife is also a member of the church um all of their family is also members of the church as well. Uh, I do have Mormon friends. The relationship has changed um, recently, but there are some who are very supportive of my decisions and some who aren't quite sure how to react. So yeah, I still have relationships with members of the church um, to varying degrees. So looking at it from that lens and knowing that more than likely your believing children or your, like you said, soon to be ex-spouse or some of these friends or extended family members, listen, when you imagine them listening to this talk, Mm -hmm. what are your thoughts about how they may either portray you or their experience with you in the last four years? How does that start to have real relational implications in your life? Ooh, that's a hard emotional question to answer. Mm. Um, I'm going to be very vulnerable here. My children who are still members of the church have chosen not to speak to me. They've chosen to eliminate themselves from my life. Um, Their reaction when I first came out that I was no longer a believer was, how could you do this? They did not want to even begin to understand the reasons why. Neither of them have asked questions. Neither of them have asked anything about my reasons why I left the church. And I think that if they were to watch this video, and I don't know if they have or not, if they were to listen to the talk, was that I I think they would think that dad is crazy, that dad has made some poor choices in his life. And because of that, we no longer want to associate with him that he's wrong and that his the reasons for leaving the church are silly are unimportant are trivial um yeah that's it's that's a hard that's a hard thing to answer because of the relationship strain that occurred once i decided to tell them my true feelings i I had no idea that you were experiencing that, Mike. I'm so sorry. That's just really heartbreaking and, you know, leads to more of my silent infuriation about how we leave so many families without the resources and skill sets of knowing how to use religion in ways that does not divide families and especially coming from a religion like ours, which you know, supposedly supports or is supposedly so family oriented mm-hmm. to leave families in certain situations, such as faith transitioning situations in such a dismal space is just so heartbreaking to me. I'm so sorry. Yeah. I understand. Um, I Part of the reason for me not sharing anything with my family for four years was because of this fear Mm -hmm. um, of what would happen once I did. But I had to make a choice, either live true to myself or be miserable every single day of my life, believing in something that I knew wasn't true or participating in an organization that that I knew wasn't true. Can you talk a little bit about, um, and any question I ask, by the way, you're welcome to just say, no, sure. I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> okay. So, but can you talk a little bit about during those four years, you mentioned that you didn't really share much, even with your wife or with mm-hmm. your kids that you, you know, did kind of more of an internal struggle, which is actually fairly 
common. It isn't something I necessarily recommend. Nor would I at this I point. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I understand why people do it <laughs> because of those very real fears, because mm-hmm. they're afraid it will change their marriage or change their relationships with people whom they, you know, adore and love. So is there, what, what would you say? What was that? What type of toll did that take on you individually to keep something so central to your life kind of in an isolated way? Oh, wow. What was that like? Um, I would say to begin with, it was more, okay, I can handle this. I can deal with this. It's okay. I'm going to be okay. And that's kind of how it started. I'll be fine. This is going to be okay. But then I remember sitting in bishopric meetings thinking, how can this possibly be? How can how can I say these things? How can I believe these things? I really should say something. I need to say something. No, I can't. I've got to hold it inside. Um, and like I said, I, I self-medicated with food. I probably put on 20 to 30, 40 pounds maybe over a four-year period of time. Um, I was very isolated. I chose not to talk about difficult things. Um, when family, when our family would get together, I would have to get up and walk out, uh, for fear of saying something I, I shouldn't. Um, I remember being in fast and testimony meetings that I was conducting the meetings and had to bear my testimony. Um, I could, and just physically getting sick and physically, physically becoming ill thinking that I would have to get up and say something. And I teach theater, I teach um, musical theater and drama. So I'm a very outward person, mm. I'm very extroverted, but I think I became very introverted and, and closed off. Um, I did not share any emotions with anyone. Um, towards the end, I physically became ill and just, could not go to church. I could not walk in the building. Um, so it was a slow progression. And from beginning from I can do this to I don't know how I can handle this. I can't take this. Mm. So it was physically and mentally taxing. Um, slept a lot. Just avoided personal interactions, personal connections with anyone. Because I, I didn't. I couldn't communicate what I was feeling or after a while. So I would say that's how it like it, Yeah. So it sounds like it started possibly bringing on kind of some of the criteria we think about clinical depression. It started affecting your mood, even your personality, mm-hmm. like how extroverted versus introverted you were being definitely relationally. It was having an impact. Um, right. And even physical like actual physical attributes, like you notice physical stress, physical manifestations, right. not just in your weight gain, but like almost triggers, like feeling nauseous or mm-hmm. upset if you were going to walk into a church building, things of that nature. Yep, exactly. But I didn't realize that that was happening until after, until I look back on my experience and I could say, oh, that's what it was. That's what I was going through. I didn't recognize it at the time. But now I, I look back and I think, how, how did I survive? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, um, and not that I want, you know, I want to kind of keep your wife out of this as much as possible because she's not here to represent herself, but you did mention that she, you know, she wasn't surprised necessarily when you finally did disclose your beliefs and kind of this new space that you were in. Is that I'm guessing that might've been because she was seeing some of these manifestations of how you were shifting or changing. Like there's only so much you can hide. Right. I I would say some of the things I would say, um, I, around the dinner table, when we'd have family gatherings, um, my daughter who was getting left the church uh, much sooner, she would say things and I would agree with her. Um, I would support her vocally and publicly on some of the stances she took. Um, there were other issues, you know, use of tithing funds and things like that, that I would talk about that I didn't agree with and things um, not necessarily related to the gospel topics, essays and church history things, but things that 
contemporary things that I did not agree with. And I would say things and she probably also saw things change in how I spoke about the church, particularly at, at church. Um, my lack of desire to even attend church as a member of the bishopric. Um, so yeah, she, she probably recognized those things, but didn't understand the, probably the reasons why mm-hmm. I was experiencing those things. Mm-hmm. And would you be willing to concede that, you know, you keeping things from her probably it ended up impacting how close you felt to her or? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I will. I would say that. Yeah. Um, right or wrong. I chose to keep them in, uh, these feelings in should I have said things I don't know that's a, that's know. that's a hard one for me to to say yes I should have um my initial reaction is why I didn't share anything is because as a family we're going through so much turmoil with our daughter that I didn't want to rock the boat any further and I mm-hmm. felt that if I did say something then the marriage would come crashing down anyway and so I kept it inside in the hopes that we can make the marriage work, make the family work and continue. Yeah. So it's, it's really complex. Like there's lots of factors to consider and in a lot of ways you were probably acting out the role that you'd been in a sense, Mormonism taught you to act out, to be a protector, to be a leader in your family, to be the patriarch per se, right. Right. To um, not burden others with your problems, to be more of a comforter of, you know, your children or of your Mm -hmm. wife, et cetera. Is that fair? That is absolutely fair. And I, that's probably one of the first things I realized once I decided to leave Mormonism is that I was conditioned to act a certain way that was not healthy for me. That was not, and it sounds kind of selfish to say, but I needed to put myself first at times. Mm -hmm. But Mormonism teaches that you don't do that. You never put yourself first. It's always others before yourself. And for me, in certain instances, that was not the healthy choice to make. But I didn't realize that until I left. And has a bit of a backbiting effect that you think you're protecting others. And in the process, you actually maybe are part of the problem. And hurting them more than they need to be hurt and hurting yourself. Yeah, yeah. I often talk about the analogy of the, um, you know, when you're on the uh, airplane and they always give you the lecture about if the oxygen oh. masks come down, mm-hmm. make sure you put on yours first and then turn to your child or somebody. And, you know, that kind of goes against your instinct of protecting, especially a child or a vulnerable person. But it's, it's so true, this idea that self-care at some level has to be prioritized mm-hmm. and we can't always... You know, the sacrifice and, you know, service are important principles too. It can't come at the cost of self-care to the point that then you can't do anything for anybody. Right. Right. And if you can't do anything for yourself, then you're not helping anyone. You're not able to help your family or your spouse if you can't help yourself first. Right. Right. And I know Mormon women talk about this a lot. I don't know that we talk about it as much with Mormon men. I, I know you don't. We don't talk about it. Um, with more women because I've been in the priesthood meetings. I've been in leadership training meetings There's and leadership meetings. There's never talk about the male mental health aspect of Mormonism. Um, I call it unrealistic expectations of perfectionism. Mm-hmm. That's really what we have within the, our, the culture of Mormonism. We are told be therefore perfect mm-hmm. and do whatever you can to be perfect, but you're never going to be perfect. And so you feel guilty about that. And it's, it's not a healthy place to be at times. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, and I also see this as kind of a, this issue of why the genders are treated differently or the sexes, I guess, are treated differently is because it's, it's kind of an unfortunate side effect of patriarchy. So because, you know, in a sense, men have all the administrative power and all the right. kind of leadership potential and all that, we, we kind of it's what's called benevolent patriarchy in the sense that we, we artificially elevate women by telling them how special they are and how wonderful they are and how, you know, they should be taken care of and loved and treated like precious, you know, objects. Mm -hmm. And we think, you know, that this is good. (laughs) 
<laughs> when in reality, what we should be doing is we should be evening the playing field for everybody, right? Mm-hmm. And so, because men need to self care, women need to self care. You know, men need opportunities to lead, women need opportunities to lead. You know, men need comforting, women need comforting. It's not, and and I think that oftentimes how I see men being talked to in a Mormon construct is this idea of but take care of your wife, take care of your family, take care of your mm-hmm. kids. Don't be a patriarchal jerk, right? Don't, right. don't be mean. Don't, you know, which, I mean, it's good to tell them not to be mean, but the whole reason why we have to tell them not to be, begin with is because we're still in a patriarchy. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. And so yep. then like, it's like, ignore all of your needs as a man, because you can't be that type of patriarch. You got to be mm-hmm. a super nice patriarch, but you're still a patriarch. Do you see how convoluted it yeah. is, right? It's so, very, it's very hard to figure out. Yeah. And there's no, and there's no forum for males to speak openly about what they're going through. Um, I've sat through, I don't know how many priesthood meetings, but you never talk about what it is that you're experiencing in a way that's helpful. And I, I hate to say that, but it's true. You never talk about what does it really mean to be a father. Um, when your child is gay or when someone you know is going through substance abuse or whatever, or depression, are you depressed? Are, how can we help each other out as males? It's always, you got to look beyond yourself. If you go serve somebody else, you're going to feel better about yourself. If you go help somebody else, you'll feel better about yourself. Well, not always the case. Yeah. Uh, that's a completely different subject, but... No, yeah. and I think, but I think it's a really important one, and because I think you're right. I think the 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 answer is do what you're supposed to do. You know, serve mm-hmm. your callings, and even that the 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 type of pressure that is on Mormon men, oftentimes from you know the provider role to the ecclesiastical roles to the husband and father roles, I, it leaves very little. <laughs> time or energy for right. like you're saying to begin with self-care you know mm-hmm. so that's I think yeah really a big problem so all right so going back then to the the talk one of the things right. that I wanted to talk about was I found a lot of I mean it's interesting I think when I feel like I can call out my own leaders on things mm-hmm. that they tell us not to do <laughs> so they tell us not to be mean and name call Right. I think that most uh, right. would say, be nice, be kind. Mm-hmm. Right. Don't call people bad names. Right. And yet this was riddled with character assassination. Yes, it was. I mean, like oh my really gosh. bad, like lazy, mm-hmm. stagnant, yep. spiritually bankrupt, untrustworthy. There was even, oh yeah, there was like, oh, selfish, childish. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a reference to being like a snake oil salesman. Yeah. Wasn't that great? <laughs> so I'm so confused. Oh In my God. Do we like resort to bad behavior when we're the ones that are supposedly saying don't act badly. Right. And as a former Mormon, which I can now say with pride, um, it was, it was name calling at its best. Um, the lazy one that that's the one that probably hurt the most stabbed me the most Um, during my faith crisis and transition I was anything but lazy it was I've got to find out as much information as I can I've got to figure this out I've got to go research I've got to do everything in my power I'll read the scriptures more I'll pray more I will do all of these things it was not a time for me to sit back and relax and chill. And there was a point where I was devouring as much information as I could from as many sources as I could find to figure this out, to find the truth. What is the actual truth about whatever subject it was? Lazy, not in the least. That's the one that really bothered me. And I'm about to do an interview as, as soon as I can schedule it with uh, Jenna Reese. I don't know if you're familiar with that name, mm-hmm. but she's a researcher. She writes, she does a lot of things. She writes a very cool blog, but she's done quite a bit of research on faith transitioners. And this is one of the things that she's actually found is that people who 
transition from the faith kind of in a similar way like you have. I mean, obviously there's always going to be the people in faith cultures that kind of grow up and leave, you know, it's kind of like they right. were never that interested to begin with, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. it's like, they're like, right. my parents made me go and <laughs> now I'm out. Right. But, uh, when we talk about faith transitioners, I'm talking more about people like you, people who are invested, people who are all in, people who are doing all the kind of things that Mormons do. Right. And then there's some type of shift and change that leads to a different position. And some of those people still stay active in the church, like you did for many years. Some people eventually end up leaving. Some people join other churches. There's a myriad of directions people go. But in that trajectory, most people take quite a while, like you're saying, of study, prayer, fasting, therapy, talking, (laughs) discussion, support. I mean, they are like really trying to make sense of these new ideas, these new narratives. Like you're saying, it's, it's anything but lazy work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That I, being a school teacher, when I wasn't in front of students, I was on my computer searching, finding, reading, downloading things to my phone so I could read things during lunch, during my off hours so I could hide myself in the bedroom and read these things on my own. Um, anything but lazy. Yeah. Well, and it's a, it's a bad role model. Like when I, I like create all this content to help people <laughs> bridge faith transitions, right? right? Like I, right? I'm going to go present next week, you know, on helping families. Like this is how you're supposed to, you know, you're supposed to be respectful and you're supposed to be loving and you're supposed to valid. I mean, I teach all of these ways, right? That people mm-hmm. can in- incorporate those kinds of skills to help in a space where it's threatening and challenging. And yet from our own apostle, we see the role modeling of, no, you can name call, you can yeah. call people. And this is what people tell me as in tears in my office all the time is that, mm-hmm their grown children or their spouses or their parents call them these names and feel very justified. I don't think people call people these names because they just can't wait to be mean that day. I think they call them these names because that's what's been role modeled and they're afraid and they're worried. And so they're trying to get you back on track. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they throw these very hurtful, very relationally detrimental things out they they use the words that the leaders use they use the words that they've heard other people use without trying to understand the individual first and i'm guessing you have experience with this yeah (laughs) um yeah there's i remember there's been a number of people who said who've said things either online or in person that it's like you have no idea the path that I've taken. Um, one of the one of my favorite ones is, oh, you just want to drink coffee. Oh, you just want to not wear garments anymore. You don't want to do those. You've lost. You ha- you no longer believe in the covenants you've made. It's like no, that's not really the reason why I went through these things. I do not. I'm not choosing to sin. I'm not doing these things just so I can drink coffee. That has absolutely nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. The one thing I wish they would understand is I wanted the church to be true. I wanted Joseph Smith to be a prophet. It's not like I said, I want to give up these things. It was not my purpose in finding this information out. It's until you really talk to a person and get to know their experience and the path and what they've gone through, you never really know what it's like to go through a faith transition crisis. You just can't know unless you talk to them. Right. And to, put, and- to, to put artificial feelings, artificial thoughts on that onto that person is detrimental to the relationship. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. To impose somebody else's belief on an individual is not healthy. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Absolutely. And I, and I just want to share for anybody who's watching, who may be, may be a believer, uh, by no means does this, does what Mike is saying mean that you have to agree or come to the same conclusions right. as a faith transitioner. 
and at the same, and this is again, a lot of what I talk about in these workshops and retreats I do is how do we validate even when we've come to different conclusions and how do we respect, you know, the fact that that reality can happen. So mm -hmm. understanding your position and validating you doesn't mean that I also have to believe Joseph Smith wasn't a prophet, right? But that's right. your reality and that's your truth right now. And how do I sit with that in that d uncomfortable space and choose the higher principle of our religion, which exactly. is love others and love Christ as you love yourself. Right? I mean, those th that even Christ said that, like those those commandments trump all the other commandments. <laughs> exactly, and that's and that's that's one thing that's been so surprising to me is that members of the Mormon faith have the have a more difficult time understanding of faith transition than those people outside of Mormonism. Um, as soon as I came out and left the church, I probably had 30 or 40 non LDS people come to me and say, Oh, now we can finally talk. I think what you're doing is fantastic. It's great. Congratulations. Let's talk about spirituality. Let's talk about God in a way that we weren't able to before. And so the dichotomy between non LDS and LDS reactions to my faith transition has been startling. That's really interesting. Startling. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and a critique I give my myself and my people all the time is that when you know you're right, it's not you can't have dialogue. So yeah. when we have these ideas that we are the one true thing, and and we're not the only ones that do that, but any people that come from a kind of a narrative where there's no room for discussion, where there's no room for other possibilities. Yeah, conversations kind of stop before they even can start. And right. I think that's what a lot of non-LDS people have consistently given us feedback on, is that mm -hmm. that's how they feel with us. Because right. we're, we're like, no, this, you know, we're very missionary kind of oriented and right. we address other people. And so it really leaves no room for a possible different spirituality. Even if you really want to be honor your own, that doesn't mean that you have to downplay another's. Right. And I think we, we don't have the skill set to know how to do that very well in Mormonism. I think it's, it's part of that. We, we look for that missionary opportunity every chance we can. Um, right. And I don't know that that's always the best approach to any situation. We don't, it's we the worst approach. Nobody yeah. wants to be told what to do, including us. We don't want to exactly. be <laughs> by other people either. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unless it leads to a missionary opportunity, then we right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we could laugh about yeah, this. <laughs> it's good to laugh. Laughter is the best medicine, <laughs> especially when you're torqued. Okay, yeah. so a few more things that I okay. want to just kind of talk about before we run out of time. But he he definitely, I think it was Elder Renlund, not his wife, who talked about a young man named Stephen, and he yeah, kind he's of the boy on the boat. Oh, he's the same boy of the boat. Okay. Yeah. So he becomes kind of like a whack-a-molar. And right. what he means by that <laughs> is that, uh, and this was a really interesting, again, character kind of assassination is that you, the people who have these complaints or have these concerns are whiners and complainers because he was able to figure out, you know, he had a question about one particular issue and he kind of got an answer that was, you know, satisfying to him in the moment but then he was off to another issue right away, you know, and then he was upset with this issue and that issue. And, and again, I think that first of all, you know, it's minimizing valid concerns with just being mm -hmm. kind of whiny. And then secondly, <laughs> it also minimizes the fact that, you know, there's not just one gospel essay. There are many gospel essays for a reason. Right. There are a lot of issues that we have to face as Mormons in yeah. our history, in our racial kind of racist, you know, background mm -hmm. and polygamy and how we treat Adam women. God I mean, theory. Oh, okay. you name it. yeah, it's not whack-a-mole that we're creating. Whack-a-mole's there because there's a lot of moles. Right. <laughs> right? And, and, you know, when you, the whack-a-mole is just these random things that come up, but the problems with Mormonism are very connected. And yes. to me, it, it starts with is Joseph Smith, a prophet, is the Book of Mormon true? And then everything else stems from there. It's not a pop-up one thing. It's everything is connected in different ways. So, yeah, yeah it's not so a this game. This is where it gets very victim-blamey is what yep. I feel because 
they themselves have talked about those things. You know, it's either all true or it's not true. I mean, that's been said by several people, including Hinckley, who I really, you know, loved. But I, every time they say that, I'm like, oof, da. Yep. absolutes are really problematic even with for us you know yep. <laughs> and, and I think so they set it up that way but then when you come to them but okay but if you said if this is true it all has to be true but then we're saying that there's a problem with this particular issue then right there there's an issue with what mm-hmm. you said but then they'll come back and say nope that's actually your issue because now you're a whack-a-mole right so it's right. like oh my goodness I can't right. and I can't the win. Thing- the, the one word or the one phrase is we disavow previous prophets or teachings on this. It's like, how could you, how did you disavow that? That's not the way it's supposed to work. Either it's true or it's not true. And I think that's part of, like you say, that whack-a-mole thing that actually they set up themselves and make us feel guilty because we didn't know these things beforehand. It's, it's crazy. It's maddening. So we have a few comments I want to read. Jennifer Wilkins Pearson is basically saying the word counterfeit. So I think that kind of, you know, is how she's feeling about this. Brittany Hartley is saying, Natasha, can we truly ask more of our leaders when they cannot understand or empathize with a faith crisis when they have not developmentally gone through that stage themselves? What is an appropriate level to ask for? Or are we asking a two-year-old to share when they have no ability to understand the concept? Is it even possible for church leadership to be the kind of person who is aware of the complexity of faith crisis since the system has rewarded people who do not, and they have risen to the top. And I would say, yeah, I think that they can. And you know why I think that? Because I've had people at my workshops and retreats who are much less educated, have much less access to resources, who care enough about their relationships that they take the few little skills I give them and run with it. And we've done, you know, post kind of retreat questions and things, and people can apply these things in their life and they're willing and their relationships start mattering more than their beliefs. And even though they, they stay in mixed faith marriages, like I know I work with so many mixed faith marriages where they do the work and they care enough, not to say that if you haven't been able to make a mixed faith marriage work that you didn't care enough, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that they, figure it out because people are capable of this. So Mm -hmm. that to me is not a a good excuse. And in fact, I would expect church leadership, just like we are as expected as therapists to figure out our own biases so that we can meet people where they are at. You know, as a therapist, I don't need to go through every single flipping experience that humans go through to be able to empathize and to offer validity and compassion There's just no way I could do that. I can't experience everything that everybody has experienced, but I'm trained and taught and I do research and I, you know, have to meet with supervisors and I have to watch my own crap all the time. And I'm willing (laughs) to do that. (laughs) So if I'm willing to do it (laughs) and people who come to my workshops are willing to do it, I think the apostle should be willing to do it. (laughs) Does that make sense? It does. I completely agree. One of the positives that has come out of this is, um, the last bishop, who was my bishop, um, when I went through the transition, he was very respectful and kind and considerate. And then he was called to be the stake president. And he and his counselor came over and visited. We had a lovely discussion about everything. And so I think at the local level, I think there is starting to be an understanding of how to handle people with, not handle, how to interact with people who's gone through faith transitions and crisis. So I think it's yeah. beginning to happen at this at the local level. I I agree. I think and even, you know, I mean everything I've heard from I think I want to say everything that I've heard from Elder Oopdorf has been fairly big umbrella type stuff, you know, where he says we want you and there's room for you and mm-hmm. so even at higher levels I think that there are people who kind of get it. We have a, a current home minister, I guess now is the word that is very willing to engage, you know, my husband and I with fun questions and thoughts. And we always leave the discussion with like, yeah, we didn't agree on everything, but we had a great discussion and he's been very open with us. He's willing to do that. That's very lovely and friendly. Um, Brittany says my follow-up would be that church leadership would never maybe receive that training, but I love your answer and keep holding feet to the fire (laughs) of the work you do. Thank you, Brittany. Yeah. Again, you know, maybe a 
it's interesting what you just said. I think sometimes local leaders do a better job of this and they have less resources. Mm -hmm. So it just doesn't make any sense to me why this, you know, why they aren't, uh, to me, it makes sense that if you're running a church, you might want to consult with relational experts, mental health experts, people who might know something about faith transitions before you just make a talk like this. It's going to actually cause more harm to your congregation than, than help. So no, I have zero ability to give them a pass. Um, (laughs) They have too much money, too much resources, and too much people that are willing to help. I'm part of the Mormon Mental Health Association. We would love to go do trainings. Sign us up. We would go do trainings for free if they would just let us in. So Mm -hmm. I know many, many therapists who feel that way. Um, Okay, so then uh, uh, one other comment here I wanted to say. Reagan June says she relates to you in that she prayed and pleaded for it to be true. You know, so again, that sense. And I want to talk a little bit about this because they do talk about faith as a choice and doubting as a choice. Mm. Oh, and so that's, you know, I, I find it really hard to understand that because I think most of us come to our thoughts and our ideas kind of innocently. And so, you know, I don't think that leaving a faith is any more of a choice as converting to a faith. And although people might say that that's a choice, what I mean by that is if you're having certain experiences or certain feelings or thoughts, that's your experience. Mm -hmm. You don't, you don't say, well, today I want to have a religious conversion experience and I'm going to make sure (laughs) everything I can to make sure I end up the end of the day being a Mormon, right? Right. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not a Mormon in the morning, but by the end of the day, I will be. (laughs) And I think it's the same for transitioners. They don't wake up going, today I've decided I no longer want to be a Mormon and I'm going to transition and make sure that I have lots of doubts that I think about. These things happen kind of organically and they lead Mm -hmm. us in certain directions, both towards and away from conversion. So what are your thoughts about how they posited the choice matter? Oh, gosh. I did not choose to go down this path. It was not something like you said, I did not wake up one morning and say, oh, today's the day. I'm no longer going to believe. Um, it, it starts with small things. It's like, and you just begin down the path, not knowing where it's going to lead. Um, I have a, a cousin who, who said something really important regarding a different matter. He said, whatever whatever path you go down, you've just got to make sure that you're willing to complete that journey. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that, you know, you don't get partway in and say, okay, I'm going to backtrack out and go back down the other path where I started. Mm -hmm. It's not something you can do that way. It's, it's not really a choice. Once you're there, it's like, okay, now what do I do with this new information? How do I handle it? And it's a, it's like I say, mine was a four year journey. It's not something that happened overnight. I don't, do I think it was a choice? No, not really. It just kind of happened organically. Um, it started with one issue that I could, you can't erase those things. I mean, even Joseph Smith had doubts. That's the foundation. That's what the church believes. The if whole thing lack, started on a faith transition. <laughs> exactly. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Well, I certainly lacked wisdom and I certainly asked of God. And my answer was a little bit different than what Joseph Smith's apparently was, but right. Yeah. It's like, it it did start with the faith transition and that's exactly (laughs) what we're all going through. Yeah. Right. Right. And it's this, again, this inability to accept that there's a possibility that we could end up on different paths and have those be right for us, you know, Yeah. there isn't an absolute path that everybody has to be on. And that's, that is contraindicated in Mormon doctrine. Yeah. And that kind of goes back to the Renlin talk. I'm on a different ship. I'm on a different boat, but we're still going in the same direction. I still believe in God. I still believe in deity. I still am doing my best within my new paradigm to live a Christ-like life. I'm just on a different boat. And it's a heck of a lot better. Yeah. And that's a valid experience. Yeah. Just like it would be valid if somebody was telling me the boat of the Mormon church is really working for me. I'm like, that's mm-hmm. a valid experience. Exactly. Right? And, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, Cecilia says kind of to your point, when I was transitioning out, I didn't know what was happening to me. Does that sound like a choice? Oh, right. yeah, that's exactly. I would, that describes it exactly. I did not understand what was happening. Yeah. It's, a, it's like Alice in Wonderland falling through the rabbit hole. Right. You just can't make sense of what's going on around you. Absolutely. Yeah. She continues. It's so isolating because it's hard to verbalize what you feel. You don't know the words. So, yeah. And then Lisa says there needs to be open communication and understanding to build a new respect for each other. Lisa Threadgold, which is exactly what I wish we were role modeling in these talks, right? That's where I hold them responsible is to role model relational skills, to role model validation. And that can be done within a Mormon construct. It doesn't mean that we have to say, oh yeah, everybody who's transitioned is right and the whole thing is false. We can have very deep beliefs. We can own our mistakes and still validate other people's experiences while holding true to our own. They're not role modeling that. And there was a recent talk, I believe given by Elder Oaks in the Kansas City area <laughs> to mixed faith marriages or to, yeah, was it mixed faith marriages? No, it was to young marriages. Young marriages. Right. And, and he also talked a lot about like, if you're dealing with, if one of you is dealing with doubts or very, very non-relational friendly to where, you know, some of the advice that was given, first of all, was, again, somewhat childlike, like, just don't go, don't look at those things, don't research, which don't research it. Again, growing yeah. up, I mean, I think <laughs> we're about the same age. And I remember as a Mormon young woman, being told that intelligence is next to God, right? Learn, go to college, you, you know, educate yep. yourself, learn not just from the Book of Mormon, but like all books, you know, Everything. and all things that are, and even our articles of faith, you know, like let truth come to us mm -hmm. and we will accept things. That Search are true. diligently. Yep. When did we become like this message of only with approved sources, which basically means only things that we tell you are okay to do. And mm -hmm. it, it becomes very like a parental, like we're kind of ongoing children that need to be parented and told what's okay and what's not okay, instead of mm -hmm. really embracing our adulthood and deciding for ourselves. The glory of God is intelligence. If we tell you exactly what you're supposed to learn. Right. It just makes it so non-Mormon. I'm like, when did we become so non-Mormon? <laughs> <laughs> that's like, a great question <laughs> <laughs> oh man anyway all right so lastly i think i really want to talk about you know it seemed like they were pitting faith and doubt against each other and to me that's so interesting because first of all the whole premise of the the, the definition of faith requires something to be unknown. Mm -hmm. Okay. So otherwise it's knowledge. And right. And I think it's we have a weird correlation in Mormonism with the word I know. You know, I know things are true versus I have faith in things, mm -hmm. which is really the more accurate thing. I don't think most of us know much of anything, at least not in a literal logical sense, right? right. Like we've seen with our eyes and heard with our ears, we're, we're having faith in things that we hope to be true, that we believe are true. So faith in of itself, I think requires doubt. And that's how a lot of the theologians talk about James Fowler, for example, you know, Fowler stages of faith is a fairly, you know, popular book that faith and doubt are kind of like BFFs, you know, they, mm -hmm. they build on each other and they, and plus, we know through social science and psychology that we're ever, ever changing beings, right? We can't stay stagnant. It's just impossible. You're mm -hmm. aging every minute. You're shift every minute. You're shifting. Your hair's growing. Your teeth are getting tartar as we speak. <laughs> you know, it's like everything is. <laughs> so we can't stay in one place. And even for people who you know are very believing in their religions, they're shifting. You know, I remember like in a more believing stance going to the temple and feeling like, wow, that's, I never thought of that before. Right. So mm -hmm. here I was same experience, but shifting, you know, still believing, but shifting. So this idea that doubt and faith are somehow at odds with each other. And that if you're a doubter, somehow that means that you lack faith or that you're non-faithful person, I think is, is very harmful. And I would like to get your thoughts on that. I think doubt and faith actually go hand in hand. You can't have faith without doubt. Um, what, 
for me, the doubts started, my faith moved to different places once I no longer doubted things and came to believe new things. I don't know if that makes sense. I, my faith in God and my faith in Christ actually increased as I was going through the transition. Um, as I doubted more things about Mormonism, my faith in Christianity and it increased. Um, it was not something where they were enemies. Um, it was something where they actually worked quite well together. Mm-hmm. They, they bolstered each other. As I doubted something in Mormonism, I found faith in Christianity. I found faith in Christ's teachings of loving all people. I found faith in believing that God loves me as I am for who I am. Mm -hmm. And my relationship with God increased tenfold during that time. So to say they're enemies, I would disagree with completely. I think they go hand in hand and my faith actually increased quite a bit in God. I I love that. And just to be inclusive to other people's experiences, I would say too, that I've worked with a lot of faith transition transitioners end up being atheist or agnostic or really not religiously inclined. And yet their relationship to spirituality or to their morals or to their values are not shifting or even growing like you're saying. So it's not this whole idea that somehow if you shift in your faith from a certain religion that you're going to go down a life of debauchery and sin and become a horrific person, that's just really not supported by any type of reality. (laughs) So if I could just say, I I consider myself spiritual, not religious. And my spirituality has, I, and even my daughter who left the church said, dad, you have changed so much. You are such a more kinder, loving person than you ever were before. And my students even have said, we like the new Mr. Hansi better than the old Mr. Hansi. And they have, they have a little idea of what's going on, but they don't know completely what's gone on. Hmm. Um, So yeah, I, Definitely, I'm a better person on this end of it than I was at the beginning. All right. So, last thing I'm going to put on your plate. Okay. So, let's say, let's pretend for a minute that we're important enough that somebody would actually listen to this that matters <laughs> <laughs> in, the, in the leadership. <laughs> you know that, right. So, I could always pretend or. Have yeah. These. <laughs> so, <laughs> if you could talk to Elder, you know, Renland and his wife face to face, if if you had a, a, a meeting with them and just, or, or anybody, you know, kind of at that level, what would you want to say? What, what kinds of things do you think that you would, what insights could you offer them that might be helpful for them to maybe, you know, what, could, how could they have served you and your family better than this? Oh, wow. I think the first thing I would say is admit mistakes, admit errors. Um, as a male, that was one of the things I was always taught, admit your mistakes and then move on and grow from it. We all make mistakes. If the Mormon church could say, Hey, you know what? We screwed up on this. We're going to try to be better. Just admitting those things I think would be first a huge step in the right direction. As far as what can they learn from people going through faith transitions, talk to us, learn our story. They, yes, they're all very different, but there's a lot of similarities in them. Um, find out what it is that we think and why we think those things. Get to know us as individuals first, and then let's talk about our experiences. Um, accept us for who we are and where we are, not for what we believe or what we don't believe. That's pretty simple. I think that's really, that's really beautiful. And your first point, which I think is just, again, so very Mormon, something that was taught to us from a very early age is the concept of repentance Mm -hmm. and repentance requires, like you're saying, acknowledgement, and it also requires apology, you know, and, and then moving in a different way, right? Those are kind of like the basic steps and any organization, any church, any person, is subject, I think, to this beautiful principle that actually is very relational focused. And and I think that if we would take our own advice, a lot of times we'd be doing better. To your point, you know, listening, being willing to listen, being able to hear somebody else's perspective, that shouldn't be 
as difficult as it seems to be. Right. And then the last thing that I would say is role model relational skills to mm -hmm. help people like your kids, your adult kids who, I mean, I'm guessing that they're hurting tremendously. I'm guessing you're hurting tremendously from this rift, which I hope is temporary in your life. You know, I hope that there'll be possibility for bridging, you know, some of those gaps, but we can't, you know, be so rigid in our ways of, of dealing with these very real issues that so many members of our church are dealing with um, in ways that really divide instead of unite. Mm -hmm. So I would really, that would be my plea to the leadership is, you know, seek out professionals and experts and people who can help you create talks that, you know, are still very faith affirming, that still resonate with your beliefs and don't cause relational rifts mm -hmm. in so many wonderful families that we have in our tribe. Yep. Yeah. I, I would agree with everything you said. Um, as you were speaking, one of the things that came back to my memory is one, as a zone leader on my mission, we were taught to seek for understanding, seek for those commonalities with the people we were teaching. The Mormon church doesn't do that with their own people. They just assume that everybody's on good ship Zion or the rusty dented ship, but they don't seek for understanding those people who are struggling along the way. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mike, for joining me tonight. First of all, it was just, a, it was just delightful to see you again. That's yeah, great <laughs> to see you too, Natasha. Haven't crossed in like over a decade. Yeah, it's been awesome. <laughs> so it's super nice to connect with you. I, I really appreciate your vulnerability and sharing, you know, some very personal things on a very public forum. So I appreciate that. And, um, and I just wish you just nothing but happiness. It sounds like you're in a really good spot after a lot of pain. And I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to talk with you and to share. And I, I would love to share my experiences with anybody who's willing to listen. So thank, thank you, you, Mike. I think it will hopefully, I mean, my goal is that this will resonate with both transitioners and believers because we're all in this relational kind of, you know, yep. stew pot together. So we yep. want to have abilities to have healthier relationships together. So thank you so much. Thank and you. for those of you who've hung in there, thanks so much for listening. Thanks to all those who commented. I love the interactive aspect of live on Facebook instead of just doing this in front of a microphone from home. Again, if you find any value in these podcasts, please consider a donation for Mormon Mental Health Podcast. I can't do this without financial support. Not only does it go to reimburse some of my time, but I actually have people that help me edit and you know, there's costs involved to having websites and things like that. So please help that way if it's something that you can do. Please spread the word and let other people know if, if there's a particular episode that you feel might be helpful to others. So everybody take care and we'll see you next time. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us today on Mormon Mental Health Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please help us and become a monthly subscriber at mormonmentalhealth.org. The goals of this podcast include education, advocacy, and the mental health and general well-being of Mormons and their families. We can't further this work without your support. Music for this episode was provided by the Lower Lights. Over last tempestuous sea Chart and compass came from thee Jesus say No way to be for me, hiding round and treasure show, chart and compass came for me. Jesus said.
Then while he 